media it is assumed that illness or sickness comes because of karma our own past actions and therefore we should go through illness and sickness to pay off karma in case we don't want to pay off karma we have to come again later this life or in a future life to pay off the same karma so why postpone a debt why not pay off as soon as possible and be done with it this is an attitude of the indian and of many eastern people and they do not want to postpone illness by saying that they are quick healing therefore the spiritual healing is not considered very important there even the other healing to medicine to the doctor is taken to be a way of settling the old karma we don't have a national health scheme or social security or health insurance therefore the person who falls in or gets sick in india has to pay for getting well he has to pay his doctor he readily pays the doctor because he thinks this way he pays off his karma and he will get well anyway most people they they think in advance and get well faster so therefore they think it is settlement of karma and why bother so much about the healing part here of course the problem has arisen because the medicines and drugs used for healing sometimes create more illnesses than the heal and therefore people have been looking at different forms of healing It do not create more problems for the body. There are many views on what constitutes sickness or ill health or not being well. Christian Science here believes that health, good health, is natural to us, and we are all healthy. When we feel we are not well, it is an error. Therefore, if we correct the error, we will be well. Therefore, there. the healing or healing by suggestion is based on this notion that the error has to be corrected it is just not reality it is an illusion that we are not well and if we can make a strong suggestion we can get well even in hypnotic treatment if not a suggestion has been used successfully to cure pain this would suggest that many illnesses if not most of them arise from psychological causes and therefore they might be what they call psychosomatic in character and if psychological suggestions are made then the illness can go away this of course has been attempted by doctors all through history a doctor comes and says to his patient knowing the patient is very seriously ill come on you are well you will be all right on your feet tomorrow morning what is there that's no problem he takes the hand and pats on the back knowing the patient is seriously ill and every time that has been seen that the patient gets well and starts walking next morning so this has been happening for long thereby revealing that a large number of illnesses are of that nature where a strong suggestion can help people to get well i have been giving readings to various people during my stay here and i find many people complain of physical illness but when i study their cases i am amazed to find the large percentage of people whose physical illness is a result of emotional or mental problem that means the physical illness is not really and truly physical it is an emotional imbalance an emotional upset or a mental problem or some hang up somewhere which is creating symptoms that are physical. symptoms are generally physical and therefore we start thinking that the illness is physical it was samuel hanneman of the famous homeopathic formula of germany who first discovered that the symptoms are not illness he said no doctor no medical man knows what illness is 
you only know what the symptoms and signs of illness are, which takes place from the body. And from that, we start jumping to the conclusion, we have found out what the illness is. Therefore, he said, consider the symptoms and signs of illness as only the language of the illness, but not the illness itself. The language is spoken by the illness so that you can treat the illness to that language. And he propounded so much theory, which in many areas of the world, not so much in the United States, is still holding the town when he said, Similia similibus curentor. That means similar will cure similar. That means if you can artificially create symptoms or illness language, sickness language in the body, artificially by any means, and those symptoms of the language of sickness is similar to the language of real illness, the illness will disappear. Much later, people in this country trying out a program for training called S, started by Werner Erhard, came across many places, they came to India also and conducted some courses. <clears throat> and they said that what is the reality? What is this experience? And an interesting point they made was, if we can mentally create the same symptoms which occur in nature, the illness will disappear. They assumed that what is looking like experience is a one-sided creation of the mind. And if we recreate at the same place the same thing, both must disappear. For example, take these flowers. These flowers you can see and experience. Supposing you could create by any means whatsoever the same set of flowers, identical to them, at the same location, at the same time, what would happen? If you created both the sets of flowers, one that are already visible and existed, and one that you create artificially, identically at the same place, what would be the result to expect? Even according to modern physics, the result to expect would be both sets will disappear. You won't see any flowers at all. So if anything is existing and being experienced by us, if an identical thing is created at the same spot, at the same time, both of them disappear. This has been sometimes referred to as the annihilation of any form of matter by antinomies when they come in contact at the same point at the same time and they only release energy and disappear. So in this way, if sickness is caused by energy changes, is caused by certain experiences, a, a disease or an illness about which we do not know, but whose language we can read to the symptoms, and if a similar strong suggestion can be made, which takes our attention to the same areas where that language is being spoken, then both disappear. That means the suggested illness as well as the real illness, both would disappear. This is in fact the basis of the strong suggestions that are made by different people for the purpose of healing. Now, it is very easy to use this method when we come to spiritual healing because the spiritual faith depends upon receptivi receptivity to suggestion. Nobody accepts anything unless there is a strong suggestion. Most of the religions thrive on suggestion. Most of the spiritual groups they thrive on suggestion. So when a strong suggestion is made by someone whose superiority we accept, then very often the suggestion works and the same symptoms which we are watching out because of the suggestion, they disappear from the body. So there are a large number of cases where these cures have taken place, where people have been healed by the power of suggestion. Of course, people have now used even the power of their own suggestion or auto-suggestion to heal themselves. If a person is strong enough and has a strong enough awareness of who he or she is, then a personal auto-suggestion can also cure the illnesses. Now, I am uh, surprised at the large number of illnesses arising purely from psychological, emotional and mental causes, which means that a large number of illnesses 
that we see around here can be taken care of by this kind of situation. But of course, if somebody has an accident and loses a leg or an arm, then by suggestion it's very difficult to get the leg or the arm back. But if somebody feels there's a pain, one can't get up, then that pain can disappear by suggestion. If somebody feels that he's down and out, can't see, has become blind, then the blindness can be cured if the rest of the eye is there. So if the physical body is intact, but the symptoms represent the illness, they can be cured by this kind of suggestion. What is spiritual healing? Spiritual healing is a suggestion. Some people don't like my things. When I tell them that spiritual healing is suggestion, this is no more suggestion, it's too in, in this the word in spirituality. Suggestion is a psychologist's word. It's a work done by psychiatrists, by clinical psychologists, by psychoanalysts. Don't use this word for such a sacred thing as spirituality or religion. But we do not understand these entities we have made ourselves. We have given sanctity to religion. We have given sanctity to spirituality. But when we are opening our own consciousness to examine what happens there, we should be absolutely unprejudiced. Then we should watch what happens. In fact, what is spirituality? If I were to say it is a self-suggestion, I would not be very wrong. One person came to me and said, you are talking of several beautiful experiences that come within. And you say, if your soul goes to higher regions of consciousness, higher levels of consciousness, you see very beautiful things. Don't you think it is all a suggestion? And to his surprise, I said, yes, it is a suggestion. He said, then why do you make it sound as if it is real? I said, I make it sound it is real because what you are now seeing and which you call real is also suggestion. What you think is your life today, your world today, this is as much a suggestion as the one I am suggesting. But this one you want to take as real and that one you want to take as suggestion, that is why I am pointing out to you that I am willing to go along with you that even these spiritual experiences are a result of suggestion. But so is the present life that we have created. Illness is not the only part that comes by suggestion. Even the feeling of good being, of being well, even the feeling of doing things, even the feeling of having a world around us, even the feeling of what people mean to us, it is all because of the power of suggestion. We are creating our world under a strong power of our own auto-suggestion. This world is coming into being because of auto-suggestion. And therefore, within this grand auto-suggestion that creates the world, any other kind of suggestion also works. So, spiritual healing is also part of the same process of suggestion. But since in spiritual healing, we invoke spiritual values, we invoke the name of the Lord, we invoke higher powers, we invoke good things, good values, therefore, there is a double benefit. It not only psychologically cures symptoms of illness, but also increases faith in spirituality and spiritual values. That is why we give importance to spiritual healing rather than healing by psychological solution. In truth, the illnesses of the world cannot be healed except by the ultimate power of healing, which is the power of when we say, have faith in God, have faith in the Lord, and His power will cure you and heal you, what are we trying to say? We are trying to invoke the power of love. Because when we use the word God or Lord, we have nothing else in mind except the power of love. I have not seen any healing more effective, more lasting than that which comes by the power of love. So when you use love as your instrument, it always succeeds. On the other hand, it also heals you, the one who heals others. Because love is not a one-sided thing. Some people have asked me, what kind of gifts should we give to people? And I have always said there are three kinds of gifts. In turning very mathematical, 
I have been trying to calculate the value of gifts. And I said, you can give three kinds of gifts. One is the material gift. You can buy something from the store and give it. You can give some cash or a check. When you give a material gift to a person, then you are losing as much as you are giving. If I had $100 in my pocket and I decided to give $40 to my friend, I'll be left with 60. The friend will have 40 and I'll have a total of 100 between ourselves. So nobody is a gainer in transferring a gift of time or matter, material gift. Material gift has this weakness that it keeps the total assets at the same level. Higher than material gifts is the second category called gift of knowledge. When you share your knowledge with somebody else, you do not lose your own mind. Therefore, if I had a hundred units of knowledge and I decided to give forty units to my friend, I would still have hundred units of knowledge. My friend would have forty. Between us, we would increase from hundred to hundred and forty. But the highest gift is the gift of love. Because you cannot give love without receiving that love. Therefore, if I had a hundred units of love and I gave forty units away to my friend, I would get forty back. I would be left with 140, my friend will have 40, total will become 180, UED. So it's a mathematical kind of thing. The point I am making is that love is a very strong force. When you share love, you get as much as It is not possible. I have not seen that happen, that you give love and don't get it back. Therefore, a person who deals with the power of love gets as much back as he gives. And the highest spiritual healing, therefore, is the healing by the power of love. But if any other powers are used, you do not get anything, and you do not give lasting help to the other person. Now, why do I distinguish between the power of love and other spiritual healing? I distinguish it because in our own system, as human beings, there is a grand division between love and energy. And many people don't hear it. They think love is also one form of energy. Love is not. Lust is, attachment is, infatuation, people is, they are all forms of energy, but not love. This distinction between love and energy is made in the human body at a certain platform that exists in the body just behind the eyes. If you take this human body and draw a straight slit at the eye point and take it right to the back, the entire portion of the body below this works on energy. And the part of the body above this works on love. It looks very funny. I'm not really talking about the physical body that if you cut it open, half will be thrown up by love and the other will be left with energy. What I'm saying is that in terms of our own feeling of how we are using the body, we are using the different parts of the body like that. At this time, we are at the back of the body. At least we feel like that. If somebody were to say, you are a conscious being, where are you? If you ask a question, even a blind man, he won't say, I am here, he won't hit his arm, he won't hit anywhere else. He will put his hand on his head, on his eyes, I am here. Because when, even when you close your eyes, if you were to contemplate that if I am a single point of consciousness, where am I? He will say, I am in the head behind you. This is a natural focal point of our own belief that as conscious beings we are behind the eyes. It is natural to us in the wakeful state. It does not mean that we are always there. Supposing you go to sleep, this is no longer the place where you are. You can't relate yourself to the position behind the eyes when you are sleeping. Of course, when you go to sleep, you don't know your body. So you can't judge where you are. But when you are Half asleep. When you are about to sleep, you can check. If you are very tired tonight, after you go back from the lecture, you are feeling sleepy. And while you are still alert, you do this little experiment and you say, All right, where am I? You close your eyes and see where you can see yourself. You feel yourself from where you are looking out. And your hands will touch your eyes. That's where you are looking out from. When you open your eyes, you will see exactly that that's where you were. And you were looking out from behind the eyes. 
Now you close your eyes, you are still there. And your eyes, closed eyes, the eyelids are in front of you. That means you have not moved anywhere. But when you are half asleep and feeling sleepy, again try and close your eyes and say, where am I? And try and touch where you are. Bring your hands up. You bring them to the nose. Nothing there is. Start feeling there is a little descent taking place. If you are able to retain consciousness and awareness of the body, and you are still more asleep, and you want to check up where are you, you bring it lower and lower. And if you could suddenly get up while you are dreaming, and touch the part of the body where you feel you are when you are dreaming, you will touch here. So, you send it to a focal point of your apparent existence as a conscious entity in the physical body. So, you are constantly moving, depending upon the state of wakefulness, the point where you feel you are existing in this body, using this body, constantly shifts. From behind the eyes at the wakeful state to below the eyes in the dream state. When you are dreaming, it descends to the sofa. When you are going further into deep sleep, where you do not feel you are dreaming, and the dreams are instantly forgotten, then you are even going further down to the heart center. Most of our lives we spend shifting the focal point of our own consciousness, our awareness from where we operate between the eye center and the heart center. And as we wake, we raise it. As we go to sleep, we go. And this is happening all the time. But as we go down, we go into the area of energy. And this is the highest area of energy, the eyes. Above that, we don't know. It's a brain. It's done for us. People say, everything happens from here. The doctors say, the, those who have physiology, they open up and say all the nervous system is there. We don't feel it like that. I touch something hot. I feel hot on my hands. People say, no, you have felt hot because the nervous system has carried the message in the brain. I don't feel anything in the head. Similarly, if somebody comes and I get excited, I feel excited in the heart. People say it's happening in the brain that the message is going. I don't feel it in the head. We don't feel anything in the head concerning energy. All energy forces are operating at different centers at the eyes or below. Now these are, these energy centers have been referred to as the six chakras amongst our yogis of the East. The yogis wanted to examine the very complex structure of the human body. And how does it store so much wealth of knowledge, memory, consciousness, awareness, possibility of knowing things that we do not know, possibility of precognition, of remembering past lives, of foretelling, of seeing the future, of dreaming things, of dreaming dreams that come out true. How does this body have all these capacities? It's all happening in the body. It must be a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing. It's the most wonderful thing that exists in this universe. I see the miracles of nature every day. You open the window and you see how that pretty color has come in the flower. It's a miracle. It's difficult to explain. Everything you see in nature is a great miracle. But the greatest miracle, how this great body can be balanced. In one of my earliest visits to this country, I happened to visit one of the computer centers, where one of the largest computers used in space programs was housed. When I met the director of that city, he showed me a computer. In those days, they were not so miniaturized. They were big sized and a big room occupied the whole computer. So I saw that and I was very fascinated by the large number of miniature circuits that had been created artificially by man. And the director of that institute told me, this is the largest computer that we have made. It can take in 10 million bytes of information. It can take in 10 million bits of information according to a program and give an answer based upon a utilization of all of them or any of them. It's a tremendous thing. And I said, look at the ingenuity of human mind to produce such a wonderful thing all housed in one room. So I said, this is great. In such a small space, so much can be done. And the director smiled and said, but sir, right now on your head here, in a much smaller space, 
you are carrying a computer which my computer has been able to calculate carries the terminal endings that can take 20 billion bytes that is 2000 times bigger than my computer so in such a small space in the body there is a computer working in us which is 2000 times better and has more capacity than the best computer that we have made outside but how come how is it made this body seems to be remarkable so this is the greatest miracle the human body is the greatest miracle in nature that god has shown us when the yogis of the east decided to explore the body they found that the body was working through energy cycles which were not easily visible people felt that they could remember things they could visualize things they could walk talk do things but they did not know that all these activities were taking place because of certain centers in the body that caused those energy functions to be performed. So they began to study through a very simple device which is called the concentration of attention on a particular thing. It's a simple device. We call it meditation, sadhana, we call it yoga. We gave it many more sophisticated names to this exercise. But the idea was that since Anything that we want to know about is known to us only by using our attention, conscious attention. So why not use the same conscious attention to know what is inside the body? That is to say, instead of looking at a thing with the eyes, we concentrate outside. Why not think with the mind and concentrate inside? So they began to concentrate on various centers, the eyes, the throat, the heart. And they were able to see how these energy centers function. And when they concentrated their attention on each of these centers, they found that different experiences came up and they were able to understand how the energy fields operate. The six centers which they explored were the ones located behind the eyes, the throat, the heart center, the navel center, the center of the reproductive organs, and the one at the rectum. These were the six centers of energy and they found that by concentrating their attention, on the focal points, they could arouse un, unusual and exceptionally strange kind of experiences in hands. And they were greatly marveled by that and they began to design a system of yoga in which through the use of power of concentration, of attention on the center, they could rise from one center to the other and come right up to the top. The top they thought was the eyes. Because when they came here, that was the top. They felt they had gone out of the head. Every time a person who did the meditation according to those systems of going from center to center, energy center, when it reached the eye center, it went like they had gone out of the head. It just shot out of the head. Though this portion they missed out. They never saw what happened to this portion. When they came to the eye center, they went out of the head. So this was a very strange experience for them. And they kept on battling with themselves. What is happening? What happens when we cross the eye center? We could not find an answer. Sometimes they have been saying that the attention goes out of the eyes. We can't hold it with it. But the fact of the matter is that there is a grand division between energy and a higher force that exists above the eye center. And that is the force of love, the power of love. The power of love is not known to the power of energy. There is no love existing below the eyes. Love does not take place from below the eyes. Everything else can take place. There is a body that is involved in so-called love. We call it the emotional body. The emotional body does not participate in love at all. And yet we think these emotions that come are because of love. Love is not an emotional experience. Love is not a sentimental experience. Love is an experience in awareness of a higher kind. And I'll just speak to you about it in a moment. But to tell you about these six centers, these six centers and the energy principle that pervades through these six centers does not constitute love. It constitutes a replica of love. It constitutes a reflection, a copy of love, which is called attachment. It leads to attachments. Every one of these centers leads to attachment. And therefore, People were mistaking attachment to the love. And in this life today, we are calling 
all attachments as well. I love my child, I love my daughter, I love my dog, I love my house, I love my friends, I love my husband, I love my wife, I love my father, I love the Lord. When we say all these things, we are really saying we are attached. Why do we say we are attached? Because in this kind of experience of attachment, we are conscious of the I. When a person says, I love my wife, he is in awareness, conscious of I and the wife both. When a mother says, I love my daughter, she is conscious of herself and the daughter both. In awareness, she has not forgotten either of them. If the daughter goes away, when the mother has attachment, which she calls love, she gets pain. There is a pain of separation. Because they were separate all the time. In attachment, there is always a separation. You can bring two people who are attached to each other as close as you like. They will still be separate. And this separation, when further increased, gives rise to pain. This is not love. What happens in love? Love is a state of awareness which is divine. It is really getting you much closer to the Lord. In fact, love in ultimate sense means the Lord himself. Love is God. What is love? In love, the I disappears altogether. When a person is really in love, and you can be in love with a person, it's not necessary to be in love with God only. If a person were to love his dog, that person will become the dog. If there is real love. In the case of love, your identity is completely merged with the beloved. With whom you love. And therefore, I is not there. Of course, I have received, after giving lectures like this, I have received a number of cards, they are very nice printed cards saying, you, 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 you. Which means, because I have been criticizing that when you say, I love you, this means you love I more than you. They have now made a new form. They gave me a cup also once, a mug, you, you, you. But the point is that merely saying you does not take the I away. When the feeling of I-ness disappears and only you overcomes you, you have had experience of that. All of it is natural to us because we are holding our heads with us. We are carrying our higher consciousness with us. Those flashes of love have come to us and we felt it. We have forgotten ourselves at that. Even this awareness has been overtaken by the beloved, the one we have loved. And that, when that happens, that is an experience of love. In that, there is no separation. Therefore, there is no pain. Therefore, there is great trust in that kind of love. There is no doubt. In attachment, there is doubt. You are never sure. In attachment, you will say, is it really so? Can I trust? Can I believe? Then you have to use these words as attachment. And it's all an energy principle. When you say, I love, it's finished. I don't care what it is. There's no I. Finished. In fact, you have no time even to say these things. Love. love takes your consciousness to the beloved in such a full way that you have no time to think of I. There's no opportunity to think of the I and I disappears. If this kind of experience of oneness is a divine experience, it's an experience akin to being with the Lord, where the duality disappears. Love is an experience where duality disappears. Therefore, when the power of love is used to help somebody in the healing process, the duality disappears and therefore the illness disappears. It is not by suggestion. The healing by love is not a suggestion to me. It is an extension of the principle that there are only, there is only one. In illusion it looks like two. We are now stepping into reality, therefore really one. And therefore, I am healthy, you are healthy. Something like that. It is transference of health to love. Very few people will use the power of love for healing. Because very few people love anyway. What is coming in the way of our using the power of love? Love is such a beautiful thing. So divine. It's the final thing. 
is the ultimate in spiritual thinking. It's the last method. There is nothing better than that. I don't know any other method. I do not know anybody who can reach the Lord by any other method except experience of love. No other way. All other ways are just preliminary to understanding the state of experience when you have love or oneness. And what is coming in the way of us all beautiful souls in here having the experience of love? There is only one thing coming in. Just one. And that is our own mind. The thinking mind. When we think with our minds, we destroy love. So the point is very simple. That thinking or use of the mind takes us down to the eye level straight away. And we descend from the level where we would be if we were in love. When you are in love, you are not in this physical body. Let me tell you, you remain in the I which is above. This becomes immaterial, irrelevant. And therefore you are total. You begin to have a feeling which is quite different from the feeling of energy. Energy is power of a different kind. Love is a power of a complete reason. But the mind comes in the way and creates this great wall. If you love love tells, if the Lord loves them. No difference in the two things. Therefore, when we use our mind and think about these things, we cease to love. Now, it's a very, very difficult problem to tackle them. And that is why meditation, techniques of God realization, self realization are looking so difficult. We are made them difficult. Supposing we were to keep our mind aside, Love would come natural to us. It is already there. Nobody has to try and love. Nobody has yet succeeded in trying and then having the experience of love. Love is there. When you try, you lose it. This trying is a mental experience. It's the use of the mind. So you can't try and have love. You can't put in an effort. Say, I am now putting in a lot of effort. When you put effort, it's the I, the ego, the mind. That is again coming into the way. Love lies natural. You don't have to seek love. You have to remove that which obstructs love. You remove the mind. Love is already there. It's always there. You don't have to go there. You have to go nowhere. Love is where you are. And it exists with you. Therefore, it is not necessary to seek love, to find love, to find a way to love. You just remove the obstacle to love and love is there. The obstacle is the mind and it's a very difficult thing how to tackle the mind. The main problem in tackling the mind arises because we identify ourselves. And this is the major clue we have to how to tackle the problem of the mind coming in the way of love. Somebody wants to share love and heal people, that person must first tackle the mind. Otherwise, you cannot use the power of love for healing. If you have dealt with the mind, then of course you have the power to heal by love. If you think you are the mind, you can't tackle the mind. When a person tries very hard, I am going to control my mind. I will see to it that my mind doesn't bug me anymore, that my mind doesn't bother me anymore. I am going to try very hard this time. Who is saying all this? the mind. Just like saying, if a dog comes here, I'm going to turn out the dog by hitting it with its own tail. I take the tail and hit the dog and say, you go out. You. I'm holding on to the tail. Just like saying, I hold on to the lamppost, I can't get away from it. But holding on. When you hold on to the thing that you are trying to get rid of, how will you get rid of it? The more you think about it, the more you use the mechanism of thought to tackle the mind the more difficult it becomes. On the other hand, if you were to become an observer, a witness of the mind, you segregate it from it. So the first step, in fact, in tackling the mind is to sit within the head above the eye center and watch the mind at work.